<laughs> I'm getting distracted really bad, seeing so many faces. This is awesome. Um, we've been having a conference here the last few days, for those that are unaware. Friday night, Saturday night, and this morning, Dr. Gladstone's been here and just had some incredible messages from God. So you guys are in for a really awesome treat this morning. So get excited. Um, I don't know if I've ever introduced myself up here. So for those that don't know me, I'm Abe or Abraham, whatever you want to call me. I'm the drummer slash announcer guy. So if you ever want to say hi to me, I'm always walking around here somewhere. Um, before we begin, though, that's why I'm up here is to do some announcements. So let's go through them real quick. First things first, our home groups. We do home groups every Monday and Thursday night. Uh, our Mondays are at two different locations. This week will be at Tyler and Becca's house. Tyler's the gentleman back there. He's the one who runs our live feed, raising his hand. He's an awesome guy. Becca's our pianist slash singer slash everything person. So we appreciate her. Every Monday at 6 p.m. So if you guys are free on Mondays, please come to our home groups. I'm telling you, the Sunday service is awesome, and I don't ever want to downplay a Sunday service, but Monday nights is like the personal family where that's where we all grow together. That's where, like uh, Dr. Glass was saying, it's where your heart gets opened because you kind of have to force it open when you're around people that much. It's kind of a family thing. Um, Thursday will be at Chad and Tehillah's, so 6.30 o'clock. They're up on the mountain if you guys need their address. Is that the address? No. I don't think we have an address for them. It's on Fire Tower, yeah. If you need the address, just get with one of us afterwards. Um, Tuesday's home group will be at um, Mountain Home at Bruce and Lori's, 35 Emmett Lane at 6 p.m. So you got so many options. There is so many groups to choose from, just Pick one of them. If you need me to help you, I'll flip a coin or something. I don't know if that works for three home groups, but anyway. Or go to all of them. There you go. Yeah, just don't pick one. Go to all. <laughs> all right. Every Thursday night, if you're between the ages of 18 to 35, is there anybody in here between the ages of 18 and 35? I feel like some people are lying, but that's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm between that age group too. Every Thursday night, we have a young adult Bible study. So if you want to dive into the word with some people that are between the ages of 18 and 35, we have a place for that and we have people for that and they're awesome. So every Thursday, and that's also at Tyler and Becca. So if you guys come to their house to like a home group on a Monday night, come to their house again on a Thursday night. You get to see them twice in one week. Well, th- oh, yeah, I guess three times because Sunday. That's, that's, a, that's a win-win-win situation. So get excited. Um, first Sunday of every month, we do a uh, morning and evening service and a meal afterward. Our next one will be on August 1st. So we'll do a 10 a.m. service followed by a fellowship meal together, and then we'll have an evening service at 6 o'clock. I'm hearing myself. Did you hear that? Oh, that's, it's really weird when you hear yourself. It's like a phone call, and you, know, you leave a voicemail, and someone plays the voicemail back, and you're like, is that how I sound? It's not what you want to hear. <laughs> for me anyway. It's not what you want to hear. All right. Um, our next announcement, uh, camp out in Peel. It's going to be September 9th through the 12th. I think all of the spots are full that we had reserved, but you can still get um, a site out there. Or if you want to just come out for the day, I think on one of the days, the Saturday. Ninth is a Friday, correct? Ninth is a Thursday? Okay, so on the 11th, 10th and 11th, I guess, we'll have a boat so you guys can come out. We'll go out on the boat, and um, I don't know exactly what all that entails, to be honest with you. So boat, water, people, food. If any of that sounds exciting to you, show up. I mean, all those things sound great to me, so. (laughs) Uh, Let's see, anything else? William Hen, this is important. So if you guys have a phone, I'm pretty sure everyone here has a smartphone, mark your calendars. This is a big one coming up. October 1st through the 3rd, we have William Hen, who is the nephew of Benny Hen, complete different types of ministries. Um, He'll be here Friday, Saturday, 6 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m., so kind of what's going on this weekend, but a couple months away from now. So last time he was here, he had a super anointed message. It was really awesome. Um, I think that's all for those. Normally, we would announce this conference, but here's the awesome thing is this conference is here now, so I don't have to announce it because it's happening right now. So if you don't want to go to that conference, it's too late. You're here. It's happening today. So no no escaping. We uh, messed up the door a little bit so you can't open it up. It's hard to get out, so you're stuck here for now. Um, Let's see. Every morning we have prayer here. So 
right through these double doors over here. I need, where's my, Jared, you're over here. I'm, I need you over here to wave your hand. I normally have Jared over here to wave his hand, but here he goes. Okay, so if you guys will look right over here, Jared will be raising his hand through these doors back here. There he is, there, give us a wave, Jared. There we go, perfect. So through those doors in that back room, we have prayer every Sunday morning. And I have to tell you, it is the most amazing way to start a Sunday. Prayer at home is good. And I don't want to ever discourage prayer alone, in your alone time with God or anything like that. But corporate prayer in the morning before a service prepares your heart. It prepares your mind. It just puts you in a whole different like, mindset for church. It becomes less about getting there on time and finding a good seat and more about just getting your ears ready to hear what God's saying and your eyes to see what he has for you. So... I encourage you guys, don't miss prayer. It's awesome. Or, you know, if you want to miss, uh, like, the first part of it, because we have some people that show up, it's, it's two hours, so you don't have to be able to the full two hours. Just want to be encouragement. Show up for prayer if you want. No, no tithes or anything. All right. Speaking of tithes, I don't know how that transition worked, but if you guys have a tither offering, um, we don't have a traditional, like, hand basket around kind of thing here. We're not big basket people. Um, apologize if you're a basket person. It's not our thing. We have a little box in the back, a little black box. Uh, it's over by Jared. So if, give us a wave, Jared. There's a black box right over there. So if you want to give in person, or if you want to go on our website, proclaimingjesus.com, you can also give on there. So there's multiple ways to give. Um, if God puts it on your heart, we don't ever want you to feel like you have to give to attend church. We want you here. Your soul is way more important than anything you can give money-wise or anything else. So we're just happy to see people here. That's what we want. Um, I think that may possibly be all the announcements. Uh, I have I have a joke. Um, it's probably it's probably not the best one. The, the ones that that uh, Pastor Chad's been doing the last few weeks, I've really just set the bar really high. So I'm a little worried that my joke's not going to be as good as his joke. So I'm going to apologize in advance. But so I got up this morning and. I was trying to pick an outfit for church, you know, because that's what you do. You're like, I want to look nice for church. And so I wanted to create something original, something that no one else had done before. So I started making this really cool belt, right? And I started putting all these like old timey watches on it. And then I realized, never mind, this is just a waste of time. <laughs> I don't know if that was good or not, but that was, a, that was the joke. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tyler, if you have anything this morning... Um, if you guys can, just keep your, keep your ears open for what the Lord's saying this morning. I'm telling you, it's going to be a blessing of a service. Um, not just because Dr. Gladstone's here, but I'm super excited that he's here because God's always here, but it's, it's us coming together. brings in the presence of God. So, How are y'all this morning? Good. If y'all just stand up with me real quick. This morning, when we, when we were praying this morning, this is just the scripture the Lord just keep putting in my heart. And so I just want to read it this morning, but we'll just keep our eyes on him this morning and just worship him. And, and uh, it's Isaiah 6 and 1. In the year of the king Uzziah died, I clearly saw the Lord. He was seated on his exalted throne, towering high above me. His long flowing robe of splendor spread throughout the temple. Standing above him were the angels of flaming fire. Each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces in reverence, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. And one called to one another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, commander of angel armies, the whole earth is filled with his glory. The thunderous voice of the fiery angels caused the foundations of the thresholds to tremble as the cloud of glory filled the temple. So let's, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for filling your temple. We thank you, Father, for filling this place as we worship you. We thank you as we minister unto you, Father God, for what you're going to do this morning. We just thank you and we praise you and we invite your sweet Holy Spirit here to do his work. And I thank you, Father, this morning. We just praise you for your blood that covers this place, covers our minds, covers our hearts. And that, Father, as we have been taught and, we, and you've been teaching and imparting something to us that our hearts are open this morning to hear what you're saying and that father god we just thank you that we lay ourselves low to you so that you may rise in us and we just thank you and we praise you that we intimately individually worship you and we praise you and we thank you for what you're doing this morning and we thank you father in jesus name
spirit of wisdom. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes. Again, revelation. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart. Cause I want to see you. Yes, I
Just lift our voice.
perfect union Nothing in between I am yours and you are mine You're still my first love You're still my only one You're still my first love 
is revealing to me around uh, settling things with him. Uh, it was almost an invitation moment um, for this morning that uh, if you will settle, whether it's conflict, whether it's division, uncertainty uh, within your own heart, if you will settle that with him, uh, he will respond to that uh, by melting your heart. And that's in a good way. Uh, melting the things that, that may be causing you conflict or division. Uh, if you will settle those with him this morning, that he will he'll melt your heart. So we're gonna continue to sing here, but just let that be a reflection moment uh, between you and Jesus right now. Um, if there's something that's been troubling you, something that's been uh, weighing on you heavily, uh, settle that with Jesus this morning. He's, he's here uh, and he's willing to meet you in that place and, and do a work in your heart. So let's just, uh, we're gonna sing and we'll just, uh, just open this moment for Jesus to come in. In my heart for you. In my heart Just reach out to him.
every situation. You know every relationship. You know every individual in this room. You've counted the hairs on their head. You've numbered the days. You know everything that happens in their hearts. Yes, we invite you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Just meet with your people. Come on, let's let that melody just prophesy into you. Just heal this heart. before us, he comes behind us, he surrounds us, he protects us. Even when we run from him, he's still there. Because he's the healer of our pain. He's the healer of our sickness. He delivers us from the lies that we those lies with his truth. He shines a light on them, like in the darkness. He illuminates the things that are hidden. You can't escape him. He's massive. He's all-encompassing. You can't get away from him. It's best just to surrender. It's best just to lay it down. His love is overwhelming. joyful noise in this place. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Invite him in personally into your situation, personally into your heart. Just welcome him in this room. Welcome him in. our affections. We just welcome him in the room. You're welcome, Jesus. You're welcome here. You're, you're worthy. You're holy. You're magnificent. Just come and do what you want to do, Jesus.
Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Father, we thank you for the heart that you've given us in your son. Complete recreation made in the image of Jesus. When you made us in the beginning, you said it was good. When you completed us on the cross, you said it's finished. We rejoice in your victory and your power over all things. We thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. You're such a good king and such a good father. We appreciate your love towards us. I'm overwhelmed, Lord, at the pursuit that you've initiated towards your people. That even when we run from you, Father, that you're the first one to pursue us. So we pray that our eyes would be opened. We thank you for that New Testament power that you reserved to yourself to open eyes. That you were the first one to open eyes because when our eyes are opened, we see you. And there's no one that can reveal you except yourself. So in that same way, Father, when your breath, your wind, your fire comes upon your people, like Adam when he first opened his eyes and saw you pulling away from him, help us see you clearly. When we see you clearly, we see ourselves clearly, we see our brother and our neighbor clearly, we see the world clearly. We see our situations clearly. We thank you, Father, we don't have to run and hide. That you are the God of all light. And every good gift comes down from you. So we bless you and we thank you. And we give you this time, we give you this moment, we give you, Father, this, this, this opportunity to hear your word. May our hearts be open and our ears be open. May the word from heaven enrich our hearts and open our eyes to see the King of glory. For when we see you, we will be like you. For we'll see you as you are. Bless you, Father. We thank you for every soul here. Enrich them with your grace. Thank you for your patience. In your name we pray and ask these things and declare your victory over this area. Jesus is King. Amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate them so much. The worship team, the Lord just moves through you guys so well. And he blesses his people through y'all. I'm really honored. Thank you guys for hearing his voice and everybody that had worked so hard here to, to put this on and to even just be a part. And, and, uh, guys in the back, they work really hard on the, the media and the sound and gosh, it's such a blessing. Um, I, I believe Paul says that we should honor the lesser members of the body. And I, I feel the church doesn't do a very good job at that. So I want to make sure I'm I'm trying to honor everybody here because um, you're important and the Lord sees you as important. And so thank you so much, everybody who served and give and you guys who come today and, and uh, be a part of us. But we want to um, just uh, give you just a moment to understand how we're going to run this real quick. It's real simple. If We're not going to pass a bucket like Abe said. If you want to give to Dr. Gladstone his ministry, um, there is a little box back there on the table as, on your right as you're going out the door. You're more than welcome to... Um, to put something in there, just make sure you designate it for him. If it goes to him, if you're a part of this body and you want to give to the church, just make sure it's designated to that so we know how to differentiate that. Amen. How I many you guys were here for the last couple of nights? Yeah. Were you were you blessed, Bob? For yeah. <laughs> Was everybody good? everybody had a good time? Yeah. Uh, the word has been really good. I really appreciate him being here. It's such a blessing and an honor to have him in the house. And so we're just going to honor you back and send us out with a bank. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm doing well. I thank God for the strength to be here. And I am just so grateful to be with you. I feel like the Lord has a special place in his heart for you, and he has a special mission and appointment in this city for you. So I just really honor you guys. I appreciate your courage to serve the Lord 
to shine for Jesus in this area, to be willing to grow and be transformed, as the scripture says, from glory to glory. Uh, I just really appreciate you and your courage to follow Jesus and to be willing to be transformed and become more like him for the sake of his name in this region and for the sake of his overall purpose, which comes to its climax when Jesus returns and rules on this earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years and then renews all of creation and we live with him forever in a perfect environment where God is all in all and your personal life contributes to that great plan and your church and the church of this city contributes to that great plan. So I honor you guys and I'm grateful to be with you. Praise God. Also, you know, the last couple of nights that I was here, I was just really expressing my gratitude for your care and hospitality, your prayers while my wife and I and our family really wasn't feeling well and canceled trips and all of that. So I, I reiterate that. It looks like there's people here that weren't here the other night, uh, two nights. So thank you for your prayers. But now I also want to add to that because Chad was taking offerings that you give in the back toward uh, our family, our ministry. So I wanted to make mention of that too, that I, you know, whoever's giving, um, I don't take that for granted and I really appreciate your generosity. It's a blessing to our family. So thank you. I'm not, I'm not here to receive a monetary, you know, honorarium. Uh, I'm just here, I'm, I'm doing my best to serve and please the Lord. But for those of you who do give, we don't take that for granted. We're very grateful. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Oh, it sounds like the end of my speech, but I'm just getting going, I guess. So uh, my, um, I guess my first text of scripture will be from Isaiah 52. And that's really actually connected to the passage of scripture that the brother opened up with today. Was it Tyler? And it was Isaiah 6. So we're going to turn to Isaiah 52. I'll just read a little bit there. And I'll connect those two passages. Because together they carry the theme for this morning that I'm teaching on. It belongs to our overall theme for this three-day conference. Of allowing the powerful word of the Lord to transform our lives. To become more like Jesus. <clears throat> And this is my third and climactic message for that. But today I want to speak about how the spirit of Christ builds the community of faith. All right now, I don't know if that sounds boring or not, but I think it's an interesting topic. So hopefully I'll make it interesting. But it's very important, I believe, that we take hold of this message. So I'll repeat what it's about. I'll say it a little differently. The Spirit of Christ builds the family of God. The Spirit of Christ builds the family of God. Now, last night we talked about having healthy hearts in the Holy Spirit, like having thriving hearts. Okay, we don't care about just attending church, putting on a spiritual face, going through the motions. You know, maybe just coming to meetings, but our lives are, are broken. They're unhealthy. We have bad relationships. We have bitterness in our hearts. We have anger issues. We have fear issues. We have lust issues. Rather, God wants our hearts. He wants us to be real. He wants us to be honest. He wants us to repent and confess our sins to one another and then fill our hearts with his spirit. So what issues out of our hearts is, is the good character of God by the Holy Spirit. Because that's where the Spirit dwells. He dwells in our hearts, not just our brains, not just our bodies, but our hearts. So that's where he wants us to be whole. Because life issues out of our heart. But that's where the Holy Spirit goes. He goes in our hearts. Because we can't be whole without the Holy Spirit. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So that's what we want to be. We want to be a people whose hearts are open to and filled with the Holy Spirit and his wonderful character traits, love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Okay, so the Spirit of God, that's the way he operates. He operates through the human heart. Even when he's operating through our bodies and like with Paul and Jesus, even through their clothing, 
It's the Spirit of God coming through the heart. That's where he really wants to operate. He doesn't want just our gifts operating through our hands or our mouths while our characters are just compromised or corrupt. That's not what the Spirit of God's into. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. He wants, the, he wants his Spirit to work through the human heart, the very core of who we are, our essence, our, our real me or you, whatever your name is, the real Bob, deep in his heart. He wants to have ownership and rulership there. So that when I serve, whether I'm speaking or just encouraging someone in private or just serving you and the Lord of my church, it, it's coming out of the Holy Ghost in my heart. Not just incidentally gifted. That was an interesting sermon. Thank you for healing me when you laid hands on me or whoever has those kinds of gifts. But the Holy Spirit wants to be in the center, in the essence of a person, in his character, in his secrets, in, in her essence, in her, in her personality, whatever, the man or the woman. God wants his spirit in the center of a person. And then he wants his life to flow out of that center. Okay, that's where the spirit of Christ works, through the human heart. And the ultimate goal of that is to build a people that's unified as a family. Even when we're evangelizing, we want to get as many people born again as possible. That's the urgency of God to make disciples, make disciples, make disciples. We want to see lost people, broken people, found, saved, made whole. Amen. But they get added to a family then. That's the pinnacle expression. That's what God's going for. To have a people who are individually so whole and discipled and healed and restored that together they become a family. Because how many people know we can't be healthy members of a family unless our hearts have the spirit of Christ? We don't have enough love or tolerance for one another to put up with one another's issues while we're growing unless we're whole and becoming whole, okay? We can't be perfect today, but if we're on the road to becoming whole supernaturally in Christ, then we're the kind of people that could actually plug into a community. Otherwise, if we're selfish, we'll isolate ourselves by just attending and then not connecting at all. But God's like, that's the opposite of what I want. I want a family. That's, that's like the greatest expression of what Jesus did on the cross and when he rose from the dead and ascended on high, it's the creation of a family. It's like if you guys could actually create a family out of spiritual brothers and sisters, not just your natural family, but if you could do it with a spiritual family where you have to volunteer, and it's like people who used to be strangers and they're growing and it's not easy to relate to them. If you could do that, then Jesus is king. He's Lord and you have the Holy Spirit. That's why that's the greatest expression of what happened on the cross and the resurrection is that these people who get born again actually become part of a family that's unified. And if you read the scriptures, the New Testament talks about this over and over and over again. We're going to look at a few of those texts. God's goal is to have a unified family. That's the goal of being a restored people, having healthy hearts, is being capable of being brothers and sisters in unity, getting through our issues, getting through our conflicts to something more glorious as a family. Many churches and ministries are predicated on avoiding this very issue. They want to be successful without having a family. Just attendance and champion preachers and great programs and whatever, what have you and whatnot. But God's the opposite. He is three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wants a family. That's what he's after. And we can't be a family unless we have the Spirit of Christ. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the spirit of Christ that creates the family. So still, before we get to the text, let me say a few more words about this spirit of Christ. When I refer to the spirit of Christ, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, right? Sometimes he's called the spirit of Christ in the New Testament. But I'm referring, of course, to the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God with us by his spirit in our hearts. So the spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit, but he's bringing the attitude 
and the demeanor of the Christ when we call him the spirit of Christ. Jesus has a certain way. He's got a personality. He's got these beautiful idiosyncrasies. He's just, he operates a certain way. He's a kind of man. He's, he's a certain kind of king. He has a demeanor. He has a spirit. You know, sometimes when we refer to the word spirit, we're referring to an attitude or a posture or kind of a personality trait. You know what I mean? Like if we say, oh, this, this woman, she comes to church, she, she always has a spirit of joy because she's always happy. So we're not necessarily referring to a literal spirit. We're referring to her attitude of joy. Or negatively, if someone's always ticked off or they're bitter and they're always saying ugly things out of this bitterness, we might say, well, that person has a spirit of anger, which may be a demonic spirit also. But if it's an attitude, if it's like this is what they're like, then we would say he, he, might, he has a spirit of anger or, or in a positive sense. This person has a spirit of joy. Well, the Holy Spirit is both an actual spirit, the spirit of God, God himself, but he also brings the attitude, the sense, the personality of Christ. Because Jesus has a certain way about him. And we have to drink in that way. We have to drink in his spirit if we're going to be a family. Because we can't be a family unless we have the very spirit of Christ. Do you remember our text from the first night, those of you who are here? It's the, the one time where Jesus actually referred to his heart, or at least one of the few times. He says, learn from me because I'm meek and humble of heart. It's just the way I am. No matter how highly exalted I am, my attitude, my personality, what I'm really into is I just want to serve everybody. That's just the way I am. He's such a servant, he can actually say that. I mean, how, do you, how, how many people do you know are so humble that they could say, come learn from me, I'm humble. It sounds like you're exalting yourself when you say that, and, and you might be, but Jesus wasn't. He was saying, look, God packed me down with a lot of gifts I mean, I'm, I come from eternity with him. He, he's with me. His anointing is on me. And I am, he would say, I am the great son of God. I've ruled from eternity, and I'm going to take my throne as a human. But I use all of that to serve people. That's what I do with all of that. I want to serve the people I love. To the point of great, even suffering and humiliation. Because he says, in my heart, that's just what I'm like. I'm that kind of person. I'm bent towards serving others to bring them up in God. That is the spirit of Christ. And we must drink that spirit, the very Holy Spirit, but not just as a force, but as the, the personality of Jesus. That's what we must drink in order to become that family that God has called us to be. So in Isaiah 52, in verse 13, it says, Behold, my servant will prosper. Or this says, deal prudently. Hmm, I don't know that translation, but the idea is that he will do well. And look at the next part of that verse. I'll read yours. He will be exalted and extolled and be very high. By the way, just out of curiosity, what translation is that? Oh, that's the King James. Okay. Usually, uh, we remember that or we hear it. I remember from the old, old church days of my younger days. Um, he, will be, he will be a high and lifted up. Because that, those are the same words used in Isaiah 6 that were read this morning. When Isaiah steps into the temple. He says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe was filling the temple. The translation the brother read this morning was beautiful. It was, uh, I'm quoting something a little bit different, but th those are the same words. That's the point. Isaiah saw the king, the Lord of Israel, on the throne, not just high, but also exalted. 
He was lifted up very high on his throne. He's the sovereign over all creation. He's the king of all nations. He is God on the throne. There's no one higher. He comes from eternity. He always existed. Everything else is created. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always existed. So the God that Isaiah saw is God. He's from everlasting to everlasting, exalted on his throne, and then lifted up even higher in that vision Isaiah saw. But there's a secret to the Lord's exaltation because that same terminology is used in Isaiah 52 when it speaks of the servant. He will be high and lifted up also. The same terms, the same phrase used in Isaiah 6 for the king is used of the servant because that's the way God operates to be exalted. He goes to the lowest place to serve and then is lifted up to the highest place. That's the way he rules as a servant. And it goes on to talk about the servant. My servant will prosper. He'll be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just like Isaiah 6. Because the king we saw in Isaiah 6 is this servant. His road to his exalted throne goes through the cross. When he goes to the lowest possible place any being could go in order to win our salvation, to pay for our sins and liberate us from that slavery. And it goes on to speak about the servant. Just as many were appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was marred beyond that of a man and his form beyond the sons of mankind. And this is the way the servant of the Lord was treated. He was, he was brutalized so that he was virtually unrecognizable. He certainly was not being honored. He was being pushed down, oppressed, brutalized for our salvation. This is the picture we have. Yet this is the one who will be brought to the same throne as Yahweh himself. And as such, the passage goes on to talk about the redemptive power of his sacrifice, his blood, he will sprinkle many nations in verse 15. In, in chapter 53, this passage continues. In verse 3, he was despised and abandoned by men. He was a man of great pain and familiar with sickness. He was like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we had no regard for him. This is the servant of the Lord, who's going as low as he can go to serve, and that's when God raises him up. So the Lord is saying through these passages that we need the spirit of Christ. If we're going to be a family, we have to have the same spirit of servitude. So, yeah, I'm going to look at a couple of other passages in a moment. But let's, let's pray right now as we look at those other passages. All right, let's pray and ask the Lord for this same spirit in our midst. Father, we pause yet again in prayer and we fix our eyes on you on your throne. Abba, Father God, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for his atoning blood. We thank you for Jesus, who is the servant of all servants and has thereby become the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We pray now with all of our hearts that you will be exalted, Lord, in our midst. That you would open up the eyes of our hearts to see your majesty as you are. We see you as the lamb before the throne, Jesus, who still bears the marks of his death. We are reminded, Lord, that you appeared to your disciples and you still had the piercing marks. Even in your glorified body, you still showed the scars of your death because you are the great servant who now reigns on high. We pray that you would open up the eyes of our hearts by your spirit to see you in your beauty and your majesty simultaneously with your servitude, your sacrificial attitude to serve people. And Lord, we pray that you will impart this spirit to us that we might become the family of God ever more in this region so that we might become your house 
in which you reside and through which you express yourself to the people around us. Lord, just like you said, they will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We pray, Lord, that you will grant us this love for one another by the Spirit of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to take you now to Ephesians chapter 4, a familiar passage of Scripture. Ephesians 4, I'm going to start a little lower and then go backwards a little bit. In verse 14, As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. So Paul's talking about the community growing up. How does that happen? The people speak the truth. Rather than being passive and being blown around by every fad, rather we're developed and we speak to one another and we cause the growth of the family. Right? The growth of the family doesn't depend on the few leaders. The leaders equip the saints, and the saints cause the growth by the Spirit. Right? The way we do church back at home, I'm like, I'm not going to perform for you guys. That's fake. When I'm called to speak somewhere, sometimes I feel the pressure to perform. I don't feel it from the people, but I get that myself. And in the morning or whenever it is before the meeting, i got to pray through that if I have that pressure. It's like, I'm not here to perform. I'm here to help people grow so they could be productive. And if, and if the effect of my ministry can't do that, I'm worthless. I'm an icon. I'm a professional. I'm making money doing this. So back home, it's like, we're not going to do that. I've had people leave our church because I won't speak every Sunday. They wanted to hear me preach. They liked my teaching. I'm like, we don't do that here. We're going to build people or we're going to die trying. I'd rather fail trying than succeed not doing what the Bible says. I want to see people's lives changed. I want to see the word of the Lord powerfully transform them into greater glories of the character of Christ so that we become a community of faith that just by being around us, you're transformed. Because there's love, there's prayer, there's God's presence. There's a powerful gospel. We don't just say it, we live it. So when we live it and say it, it's transformative. Anything else is religion, and it just brings more devil into the region. Somebody somewhere has to counterculture that. Go against the stream. It's like, okay, we're going to be real people. Some of these spiritual people, they come off as spiritual. Okay, we're not so spiritual. We have character issues. But you know what? Okay, I'm going to confess my sins. I'm going to get some help. I want to grow. I want to be like Jesus. So that we could be a healthy family that embodies Christ in Harrison, Arkansas. And the region, if you're from one of the other towns or whatever. Or watching... On Facebook, whatever region you're from, God wants a church in that city that embodies Christ. And that's precisely what Paul is talking about here. In this passage, it's healthy people becoming healthier, and I mean supernaturally in the spirit of Christ, who are therefore able to speak to one another and bring transformation to the family. That's what he's saying. We're no longer passive little children just blown around by what everyone is saying from a pulpit or whatever, whether it's good doctrine or bad doctrine, we're passive. But in verse 15, we're the active in causing growth. We're speaking the truth. We're not just listening to other people say it for us. Each of us has something to offer. And when we say it, it causes growth. That's what we want. Listen, right now, I'm in front of people. I'm, I got a pulpit, and I'm speaking. It's one person speaking because it's teaching. That's my gift. But then I leave. 
So I could do that professionally, so to speak. But when I'm home, I don't do this. Well, I do it once a month or so, maybe less, sometimes more if we're going through a series. But the whole result is supposed to be, okay, guys, now, now you all do it. And that's what we do. I don't then blow out of town there. I'm, I'm, I stay and I say, okay, let me help coach and let me try to do it myself. Let's be the body here. Let's all contribute. Let's grow. And when we're contributing and some silly stuff comes up or bad stuff, it's like, okay, now let's deal with that. With love. And that's what we do. We're not doing church as a performance or just an affiliation or just showing up on Sunday. We're trying to grow into the people of God. And I found there's no way anyone has any tolerance for a family that becomes one together unless we have the spirit of Christ. If we don't have his spirit, then we can't be a family because the spirit of God as presence draws us together. But as Christ's demeanor gives us the attitude of the servant that makes the family. So we're looking here at the result part of this passage. There's the speaking of truth and love. Then we grow up in every way into him who is the head. See that idea of maturity? We talked about it earlier as individuals. Now Paul is saying we need the same growth and maturity as a church. Because anybody can grow up by themselves with the Lord. At least they can gain some maturity. But to do it together, whoo, yeah, that's challenging. I don't see any way, personally, actually, what I just said, I'm slightly going to contradict. I don't see any way to grow personally unless we're growing together. Because I don't know in me what needs growth unless I have other people pulling out some of my impatience issues or some of my selfish issues, right? We're all called to carry our crosses. I remember one preacher putting it this way. His name's Richard Crisco. I remember him saying, I, could, I can hammer my own feet to the cross myself and I could do one hand, my other hand kind of, but that last hand, I need other people. <laughs> we kind of need other people even for the first hand. <laughs> unless you're really fast, skilled. But we, we can't grow in the life of being crucified and risen unless there's other people around us that are in this with us together because that's what God wants, right? So it's the body operating that causes the growth. There's no other way to be true disciples unless we develop community and are really together and talking to one another, helping and giving grace and gentle correction and just providing the opportunity to grow. Praise God. There ain't no way anyone will sign up for that unless he or she is imbibing the spirit of Christ. So here's Paul's result. We're growing up in every way, verse 16. We're growing up into the head, verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. So every member of the body and then every joint where there are those connections in the smaller versions, every part of the body is contributing. If it's not, if every member is not contributing, then we're not growing. So it's, we're being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. Now look at this last phrase. That causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The body causes its own growth. Well, how can that be? It's the spirit of God that causes growth. God's the one who causes the growth, right? Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. I thought God causes the growth. Now Paul's saying it's the body that causes the growth. So which one is it? Yes, it's both. If we're not stewarding our gifts with a vision for developing family, then God won't cause the growth. Even in that earlier passage, Paul had to plant, Apollos had to water so that God would cause the growth. 
So unless we're stewarding on purpose the kind of life that builds up other people, we won't grow. But if we do, we cause our own growth by the Holy Spirit. In order to do this, we all must have the Spirit of Christ. Good night, Bob. You've said that like a hundred times. We, we're getting that. Okay, well then we'll, we'll, let's, let's go a little deeper by going up a little higher. Verse 7. Okay, Ephesians 4, 7. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives and he gave gifts to people. So there's a remark about the ascension. The king was exalted on high. There's that picture of the exaltation. There's Isaiah 6 again. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Here it is from Psalm 68 and Ephesians 4. Jesus ascended on high. When he did, he showed forth his victory over all the powers of the air. He sacked, he already defeated them at the cross and the resurrection. Then he took his throne over them. And he plundered that army and gave the plunder to his people, which are these five gifts he's about to mention in two verses. So there's your exalted king taking his throne and giving the wealth to his people. But when Paul quotes that passage of ascension, he pauses in verse 9. Okay, now, this expression that he ascended, quote-unquote, what does that mean? except that he also had descended to the lower regions of the earth. So Paul says, hold on a second. If I'm going to talk about Jesus as king, high and lifted up, victorious over the powers of the air, and giving the plunder of those powers to the church in the form of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, if I'm going to talk about that, I, I can't mention that without pausing and saying, ah, but the great king went as low as you can go to get to his ascended throne. He has to mention that. Because Jesus' victory and Jesus' exaltation is not generic. It has a certain character. There are contours. There's a shape to Jesus' kingship. And it's the shape of a servant. He is so high because he went so low. God does not exalt people who exalt themselves. He resists them. They're resisted now even if they're successful. Because one day they will be fully resisted. No one who exalts himself will remain exalted. Jesus promised us that. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. That's the spirit of Christ. He says, my job is to go down where God told me to go, and then he will lift me up. That's the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ refuses to lift itself up. It brings itself down to serve. I don't mean self-degrading, criticizing myself. That's just self. I'm just trash. I'm terrible. No one likes me. It's like, no, no, don't be so selfish. Repent of that. Let the saints encourage you of how wonderful you are. And then be humble, not by speaking negatively about yourself, but by serving other people. <laughs> That's the spirit of Christ. My job is not to exalt myself. If this person wronged me, I'm not going to defend myself and get angry and you make my point, that's exalting myself even if I am right. I'm going to humble myself. That's my job. Then all the exalting, God does. So Paul says, you have to know something. The anchor of the entire community, the way we can have love for one another is by having the spirit of Christ. He was lifted up by God because he went down low to serve. So he mentions this expression in verse 9, he ascended. What does it mean except that he had descended to the lower parts of the earth? The humility of Christ is right in the center of this passage. It's the same pattern every time. He, he started from up here, he went down very low, and then God raised him back up. It's the shape of a V, victory. Come on. From here, down to there, back up, victory. But that's the only way. And then in verse 10, he who descended is himself also he who ascended, far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. 
And then he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now you have this abundance of wealth to build, build the body of Christ. But guess what? Those five ministries, they should now have the spirit of Christ that we read about in verses 8 through 10, right? Yes, he's king because he served. That's the same spirit of the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers. They're not leaders so that they can be promoted by the people and have their office and their gift and their wealth. They should have the spirit of Christ. Oh, the one who went to the lowest of the low regions of the earth. That's where I go for the people that I'm called to serve so that they can be better. They could be even lifted up higher than me. That's the spirit of real leadership. You know how I know that? Because I look at our great leader and all of his victory and exalted status comes from his ability and willingness to go as low as he could go because we needed him to go there. You understand that we needed the blood of the Lamb of God. And we needed him to be crucified on a cross in the spirit of Isaiah 52 and 53. We needed the sacrifice. We didn't deserve it, but we needed it. So he gave it because he loves us. That is the spirit of Christ. And there ain't no way we're building family unless we have the same spirit in us. Not just the spirit of God generically, like a force, but the spirit who shapes the contours of the servant Christ in us so that we're willing to live the same pattern he lived so that we can grow together. You know, everything I'm teaching is just kind of plain Bible. It really is. There's no secret knowledge here. There's no magic formula. It's just common sense biblical teaching, if I might say so. But it's rare. It's not often taught. It, it doesn't shape the church. <clears throat> we, we can't, we can't go that route. We have to go the way, of, the way of Christ, the way of the scriptures, and take hold of this and go for it. And the leaders that Paul lists, this is an exhortation to them. Any leaders here that might be listening or watching that are here in the room, it's like the same spirit should mark all five of these gifts. The spirit of Christ is willing to go as low as he can to meet the needs of people as God sees them met. Sometimes people think they need things they don't, but... As God saw the need, his son was willing to meet it at his own expense. And that same spirit should fill all five ministries so that then the body can have the same spirit because they're equipped by those same ministries. You follow the way that chain link works? It's beautiful. In fact, let me show you one other thing. We have the five ministries in 411. And then in verse 12, let's look at this one more verse before we go to our final passage. For the equipping of the saints. These five ministries are given for the equipping of the saints. That word equipping is a beautiful word. It means to make ready for service. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That word equipping can also be used as a medical term, which means to restore. Like a broken bone being fixed into place so that it will be restored, so what was broken will be fixed. That's what that word means. It can also be used outside of a medical meaning to just fix anything to make it useful for service. That's what the word means. Do you remember when the disciples were mending their nets? That's the same exact word. The nets were broken. Nets that are broken, nets that are ripped, can't hold the fish. So they had to fix what was ripped in order to make the net useful and good. So it's not just fixing something so that it's not broken. It's fixing something so that it's useful. So this same term refers to people. Just like my last two messages these five ministries are not just showing people how to do something. They're helping people get whole so they can be useful for the master's work, which we read further a little earlier. We read the result. We're serving one another to grow. So the five ministries help people get whole. So they're genuine Jesus followers. 
honest and transparent and flourishing in the Holy Ghost, then those people can help other people grow. And that's the work of ministry, whether you're bringing new ones in or you're building them up, up once they get in. That's the spirit of Christ. It serves people, makes them whole, so they can serve people and help make others whole. In Jesus' name. One other passage. No, I might have two other passages. <laughs> I haven't even been speaking half an hour yet. Is that possible? I might have five or six other passages of Scripture. We may be here all day. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking about that. Don't worry. Philippians chapter 2. Did you know I was going to preach from Philippians chapter 2 after all this? Did you have a sense of that? No. This is the classic passage. In one sense, I've been talking about Philippians 2 so far this entire time. Here Paul addresses this very theme directly. And so this is a passage, perhaps along with my next passage, that I would really love for you to take home and focus on over the days ahead. Paul is speaking to a church that has some issues of division. In particular, there's two women who are at odds, but there were also other elements of division within the church of this city, Philippi. And so Paul is urging them with great urgency to be unified. But he can't encourage unity out of the blue. It has to be Christ-centered unity. There's no way we have the energy to overcome our conflicts unless Christ is our Lord and our example. The very gospel itself of Jesus, Son of God, crucified, risen, ascended, that spirit must be the spirit of the community or we cannot heal our divisions and be one. Paul addresses this head-on in Philippians chapter 2. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, kind of what he's saying is, guys, have mercy on me. He's literally asking them to serve him. Please, if, if we have any fellowship, if there's any affection, if there's anything of Christ and regard in you, Please make my joy complete in verse 2. He's asking for their service. Please make me happy by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love. United in spirit. Intent on one purpose. Okay, he's saying, you all are divided. There's conflicts. There's especially one conflict, but there's others. I beg you, in the name of Jesus, get it back together. Get back on the same page. Find your unity. Love one another. Get over this nonsense and be a family. That's what he's urging them. He's like borderline begging them. But the way he thinks, he carries on this way. He starts to instruct them. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Now we're getting down to some brass tacks. Paul's jumping in their minds. He's getting into their hearts. You can't just get on the same page unless you have a posture in your interior. You have to have a spirit in your spirit. Now that spirit is the Holy Spirit, but not just generically, theologically the Holy Spirit, but the spirit who has that same personality, that demeanor, the contours, the example of Christ. You see? Let each of you regard, have this same, what, I, 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 okay. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. There's a posture on the inside. 
Each person literally should look at other, per, other people as more important. Not because, I, I can't say I'm less important. I'm not saying that. I'm not pushing myself down in a self-degrading way. I'm lifting you up above me. That's different. In fact, I can't lift you up unless I really know who I am. If, if my heart is whole in Christ, I can afford to put other people first. I don't need to exalt myself. If my heart is whole in Christ, I can afford to put other people above me and not have to exalt myself. Very, very important. Humility is not degrading ourselves. It's serving others because we're confident in who we are. And I'll show you that through our promised last passage of Scripture in a minute. So I want to be whole. I want to know I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm liberated from the opinions of people. I'm comfortable in God's love. I can afford to serve other people because I don't have all these other carnal needs now. I'm free to serve. Paul's getting right into their interior. He tells his congregation... You need this on the inside. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Now, where are you getting that from, Paul? He continues on to speak to their interior in light of the gospel, in light of the story and nature of Jesus. He says, the next thing he says is, am I right? Have this mind in you, says your translation, have this posture in you, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, there it is. Philippians 2.5 is the theme verse for our message today. The spirit of Christ creates the community. Well, here's the spirit of Christ. Here's the call to take the same spirit. Have this same way of thinking, this same posture, this same demeanor, this same attitude on the inside, which was also in Christ Jesus. You understand what Paul's saying? He's saying, I'm not asking you to humble yourselves, serve one another, and be unified out of the blue. You can't do that. You need the example of Christ, and you need his spirit. So drink that in and be like your king. If you look at your king, if you gaze upon him, if you soak in the gospel, the message of your king, if you feast on the truth of that gospel and use him as your example, you will have the energy to lay your life down and serve other people's interests instead of your own. And I think I skipped that, that verse that said that. Don't look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. There's no way to do that unless we unveil Jesus and look at the beauty of his kingship. And his kingship came from the highest place down to the lowest place, and then God raised him up. Paul says, you put your eyes on that king. You see the way he dealt with life. He served God. He laid down all of his rights. He laid down everything, and then God lifted him back up. You need that same spirit and that same promise, and you'll have the energy to lay your own lives down and serve one another. That's what Paul's saying. It's the spirit of Christ. He says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, something he had to grasp onto. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul's saying you have to have his example and his leadership to follow him into this kind of servitude. There's no human being who had more rights to claim his rights over other people than this man. He was always the son of God. But he didn't treat his sonship to God as something he had to insist upon. How dare you treat me that way? How dare you criticize me in your synagogues, you Pharisees? How dare you do that? I'm the son of God. 
I deserve better treatment than that. I'm the son of the, the God that you supposedly served throughout all your Old Testament eras and now fulfilled in this era. How dare you treat me that way? He, he didn't insist you have to treat me this way. Using his sonship, his, his divinity as leverage to have influence over people and get something he deserved. He didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So if Jesus did not regard his equality with God a thing to be grasped, I, who am not equal to God, probably don't have many things I should be grasping onto and insisting on over you either. If anyone has a reason to insist on his rights and his dignity, Jesus did, and he didn't. <laughs> he emptied himself, and he took the form of a slave, the complete opposite of the way we would envision God. So that pretty much strips all my rights to gain leverage over you. You see what I'm saying? It's like, I don't just come up with this humility on my own. I look to my king, and I say, okay. If you came from that high of a place and went to that low of a place, then I should do the same. <laughs> my, my life pattern should be the same as my great leader, the example. Do you see what Paul's doing here? He's literally trying to heal the division that's between two women and then other divisions in the church by unveiling the majesty of Jesus and showing how low he went. That's how he does it. He fixes it by saying, let me preach the gospel to you again and show you and remind you who Jesus is. You're forgetting who Jesus is. I can't tell you to overcome these conflicts just by encouraging you to be unified. I eventually have to pull back the curtain and say, look at your king. Look at him. Look how great he was and look how low he went. You can't get more degraded than crucifixion. And he did that to serve the needs of people who were beneath him. But he treated them as if they were above him. Now, if that's your king, what y'all fighting about? Why are you exalting yourselves? See your king? The spirit of the king creates the community. Come on now. You can't exaggerate how low Jesus went. His whole posture was that of a lowly servant. But to then take on the action of an obedient man. I mean, just taking on the form of a man when he had the form of God. But then he was a slave in the way he obeyed. Not in any way belonging to himself, but only to God. Completely selfless. And that took him to death. Here's the prince of life, the son of God who is by definition life itself, dying a human death. But Paul says, even death on a cross, which is as low as you can go. It was a form of capital punishment preceded by long hours of torture borrowed from the Phoenician people and taken over by the Roman Empire so that it would not only torture someone to death, sometimes over several days, but also utterly and absolutely demean and shame them in public as part of the punishment. It's horrifying when you think of it. It's like someone being completely humiliated and degraded like an animal, like a dog in public. But then it's, it's not like, okay, that's enough. You've been, you've been humiliated. Then take them off the cross. It's rather you're completely humiliated Stripped of clothing, lacerated with these, these horrible flagella. No bathroom break given. No way to bat away the flies or the birds. But then you just hang there till you die. It's like there's no, there's, no, there's no good ending to it for those that suffered this who weren't Jesus. It's like total humiliation. Before, the Romans are saying, before we kill you, as a punishment in your physical body, we're going to kill you socially and dishonor and shame you in order to demand a certain level of allegiance. You know, Roman citizens weren't even allowed to be crucified. They, they were beheaded if they had to be punished with death. They weren't, they weren't taken through that kind of pain and humility, humiliation, I should say. 
But those outside the citizenry, this is the way they were treated. The cross was not a religious symbol in Paul's day. It was obscene. It was torture. It was degradation. Paul said we needed his blood that way, so he was willing to go that low for us. That's the curtain being pulled back saying, those of you who are having your little differences, behold your king. Therefore, God highly exalted him. Now, this is part of the motivation. Not only is Jesus is our example of going low, but he's our example of God exalting those who go low. Now, we're certainly not going to be exalted to the, in the same way Jesus was as the ultimate king and son of God, but God will lift us up the way that's appropriate, right? Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. Therefore, at the name of Jesus. See, here's your Isaiah 6, every knee bowing. Think of the entire universe Think of Hitler's and Stalin's and North Korean dictators and Mussolini and whatever other leaders throughout history have been oppressive dictators to people, rumbling out of their graves with their to-be-judged resurrection bodies because there will be a resurrection of the wicked as well as the righteous. Coming to this great assembly, every one and bowing his knee before this one king. That's Jesus the king, and every knee will bow to him. That's highly exalted. Why was he so highly exalted? Because he went down so low. Paul says, therefore, God highly exalted him and put upon him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every knee. Every single solitary human being that's ever lived, even the Antichrist at the end of the age, will bow the knee, and say, yes, he's the king. King Jesus is Lord. Every single person. That, let me say it this way, those are the contours of his kingship. That of the humble, broken, humiliated servant that God exalts and clothes with dignity. So a couple of other observations from this passage. In the first half of the passage, when Jesus was humbling himself, Jesus is the actor. He's the subject of the verbs. He humbled himself. He he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself. Jesus is the actor in bringing himself down. In the second half of the passage, when he gets exalted, who's the actor? God. Jesus doesn't lift himself up. Therefore, God highly exalted him. You know how much peace floods the heart when we trust God to lift us up rather than lifting ourselves up? It's like, God will do that. I don't have to do that. I lower myself, and then God raises me up. I don't have to promote myself. I don't have to vindicate myself. If those people don't know I was really right or I really didn't say those things, You know, sometimes we need to explain to fellow Christians, this wasn't me, whatever. We have to talk it through. But sometimes you just can't defend yourself, guys. We have to trust God to lift us back up. Jesus didn't put on a robe while he was on the cross. He didn't bring himself down. He gave up his spirit and died. And they buried him in that humiliated state. But God restored his dignity to all of creation including those that crucified him. He ain't naked no more and looking like the court jester on a stick. He is king of kings and lord of lords. We have that promise. We can afford to lower ourselves and serve one another. We're not facing crucifixion. We're just facing trying to love and esteem one another and serve and honor one another. Amen? Amen. In order to build one another up, I really do only have one more passage, and I just have a few comments to make up on it. It's John chapter 13. John 13, beginning in verse 1. 
John 13 is basically Philippians chapter 2 in an acted out parable that was much more than a parable. The same exact pattern of the man of dignity putting aside his dignity to come to the lowest place of a servant and then being raised up from that position of a servant as an example for the community. It's exactly what we have here in John chapter 13. Now look at this in verse 1. Before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart from this world. Do you notice this? He's aware of what's happening. He's not just trying to be a servant. He's aware of God's plan. He knows what he's doing. So he knows his hour has come that he would depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them even to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. So Jesus is aware that the devil is at his fellowship table. And that there's a dirty, selfish cheater who's there not to enjoy fellowship and serve the Lord, but to betray him and make money off him. He's fully aware of this and still fellowships with him. Shares the meal, later calls him friend. He's not honoring the way he's stewarding his life and he lets him go his way as the son of perdition. But he's fully aware of this and he's not banging the table saying, how could you do this? It's exactly the attitude that I wanted to manifest in my problem a few months ago. After all I did for you, this is, this is the payback I get? And then I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> my king had a bit of a more extreme situation and he was perfectly innocent. I'm not. And he had a much more extreme betrayer. I had nothing like that. And he's just aware of this and carrying right on with the Lord's Supper in the purity and innocence of his heart, letting him kiss him later and calls him friend. I'm like, man, I need a, I need a bigger vision of my king. So what if I can parse a Greek verb? Is this my character? And Jesus isn't faking it. He's not sitting here thinking, just wait clenching his teeth. I'm going to get through this supper. And in the end, Judas will get, he's like, I'm going to take off my robe of dignity and put on the towel of a servant and wash these people's, these brothers' feet, including Judas. So the devil already put it into the heart of Judas. In verse three, now Jesus knows that the father had handed all things over to him. You see, he knew who he was. This is how he could afford to serve, not because he viewed himself in a self-demeaning way, but he knew who he was. He knew he was the heir of all things, so he could afford to lay aside his dignity and serve these people because he had that promise of what's coming after, and so do we. We are allowed to be energized by the promise of being exalted later. We are allowed to be energized by the promise of reward. Jesus served the disciples based on that knowledge. God's going to restore everything to me so I can strip it all here. This world is not my home. That's what's being said here. Come on now. You see how the attitude of a servant needs the spirit of Christ? We like literally need the vision of the future to serve people here. It takes great courageous faith to believe we will be vindicated at the resurrection so we can give it up here. Man, the Lord is calling us to have strong hearts that prosper in the Holy Ghost, that actually have a vision of resurrection now to energize us to serve the people sitting next to us and around us. So Jesus knew in verse 3, the Father had handed all things over to him and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. So he knew who he was. He knew all this. That's how in verse 4, he got up from the supper and laid his outer garments aside, and he took a towel and tied it around himself. In verse 5, he poured water into the basin and began washing the disciples' feet and wiping them with the towel which he had tied around himself. You have to understand that that one verse, in verse 5, and we will read on in a few moments, but you have to understand, Jesus should not be taking this action in his culture. 
the, the, Middle East, the ancient Middle Eastern culture and many cultures in the Eastern world and sub, some of the subcultures, even in the Americas, th- they are like this culture. They're called honor-shame cultures. People of a certain status, a certain place in their society. In Jesus' case, he was a teacher. He was a well-known rabbi. You carry that honor. You don't lower yourself before it. And the, the person who had washed the feet of house guests in that culture was like one of the lowest positions you could go to. So if a family could not afford a servant, then the youngest child would have to do it because he or she was already naturally of the lesser variety. They might grow a little bit into a greater honor, but for now, only the people that were of a certain low status should do the dirtiest job of washing people's feet. I mean, the, the, the feet are the instruments of the body that carry us around in especially very, you know, dusty streets in the ancient world that are not always swept, if you know what I'm saying. They didn't even have bathrooms at their gas stations. You know, the way that things went, it just was not always the cleanest environment. So the person that washed the feet was doing like the lowliest job. And here Jesus is sitting as the leader of this supper. He is clearly a great prophet. He's already been confessed as the Messiah King. And just in his society, even if you don't believe he's the Messiah, he's a great rabbi. You don't change your clothing and take on the role of the lowliest servant. This is why he was resisted. Peter said, you will never wash my feet. You are metaphorically taking a position that's shaming you. Shame is hated in the ancient world and honor is loved. It was shocking that Jesus took this position. And if you understand what I'm saying and read some of the other texts of scripture, you'll see that Jesus cut right against that value system. Saying if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. That doesn't work in our culture. If someone smacks you on the right cheek, turn to him the left also. To smack someone's face, the face was the place of honor, the head and the face were places of great honor along with the right hand. And then someone smacks you with their hand of honor to shame you in public, you have to smack them back. Or you lose that game and you are now lowered forever in that society. I mean, there's, there's many things like this even in the world today, but For instance, in Thailand, if the king of Thailand is present, your head cannot be above his head. You have to be below it. You have to come in lower because the head is a place of honor. So if you're putting your head up above someone of great honor, then you're shaming him. And it's very dangerous to do that. You have to keep the social strata, the social classes. And Jesus goes from what in this environment was the highest place, he goes as low as he could go. So just verse five, If we're reading this in that context, it takes our breath away. We're like, there's no way he's doing this. And Peter gives us voice in the story. No way! And Jesus says, well, if you don't let me, then you don't get get what I have to give. And he's like, well, then wash all of me. He says, one extreme to the other. (laughs) But you understand the position he's taking. I mean, this is the highest going to the lowest place. Shocking. I mean, shock waves throughout this Passover meal. They're just twisting, in a good way, twisting their brains. It's like, what is this picture? This contradicts our reality. Rabbi. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, you're washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing you don't realize right now, but you'll understand later. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I don't wash you, you have no place with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet. Otherwise, he's completely clean, and you're clean, but not all of you. In other words, I've been washing all of you. You're all clean. You're just getting dirt on your feet as you walk through this world. So I'm going to keep serving you and washing that off, but you should be washing it off one another's feet. Verse 11, he was referring to Judas when he said, not all of you are clean. So he knew the one who was betraying him. It was for this reason that he said, not all of you are clean. Now, verse 12, when he had finished, excuse me, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and then reclined at the table again. So he took up his position of dignity again. There's the V pattern from Philippians, from up to down, back to up. 
Here's what he says, and I believe it's what he's saying to us. Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because I am. That's a humble servant right now. He doesn't deny who he is. He knew exactly who he was. That's how he was able to serve. You call me teacher and Lord, or Lord and teacher. No, teacher and Lord, verse 13. You're right. That's what I am. Okay, now, if I, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example so that you also would do just as I did for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave's not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. Really simple, beautiful, powerful teaching. It's not a matter of figuring out all kinds of mysterious sayings. It's a matter of having the courage to embrace the spirit of this king and follow his example in serving one another to become and be and grow as the family of God. Amen. I would like for us to stand together and I'd like to pray for you. But before I pray, I would like to invite you to do several things. Very, very simple list of requests from me. Really, I believe it's on behalf of the Lord. Just a few simple things to take home in your heart. First of all, I would like to invite you to look back over these passages of Scripture, especially this John 13 and Philippians 2, and simply ask the Lord to grant us the spirit of that king. Just ask. Just look at the texts. Behold the model and example of our king and ask the Lord for the spirit of that king. Now, we already have the Holy Spirit if we're Christians. So I'm not saying to receive the spirit of God for the first time to be regenerate, to be born again. I'm saying, Lord, give me more of that demeanor of the king by your Holy Spirit. So let's ponder these texts and ask for the spirit of our king. Not just the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of our king. You see what I'm saying? The second thing I would like to invite you to do is to ponder where, let us ponder in our hearts, where our hearts are resisting that place of service and unity and ask the Lord to come in there and show us where the root of our stubbornness is so that we can repent and replace it with the truth. Okay, just on our own, in our prayer time, or as we go through the day, it's like, Lord, where is my heart demanding its own way over the good of those around me? Where am I resisting the spirit of the servant king? Where is there something contrary in me fighting this spirit? And invite the Lord in there to grant you and me repentance and transformation. The third thing I would like to invite you to do is to look for places and ways to wash the feet of the saints. You know, we're not generic. People have different gifts. Some people are powerful exhorters, and we just need to look for opportunities to exhort people who are discouraged. Other people, it's like, I don't have much of a speaking thing, but I could just help in so much. Just help, physically help. Other people, they're not good with like physical helping, they may not be skilled in certain things, but they, man, they pray like nobody's business. I mean, I understand. Now, sometimes we just all need to chip in on certain projects, but, but also sometimes we're oriented in certain ways. We have certain giftings. In light of that, I would really invite us, let's deliberately, intentionally, maybe aggressively say, I'm going to look for ways to serve because I got a different attitude now. Sometimes we're not in conflict, but we're just kind of coasting. Right? We're just, we're not, we're not against anybody. We're not resisting the concepts, but we are just kind of laying back and being a little selfish by not doing anything. Well, let's change, let's reverse that. Let's take in the spirit of Christ and look 
for those places where God is saying, I need you to serve. And it won't be convenient. You might have to get up a little bit earlier. You might have to come in a little bit earlier. You might have to make a couple of extra phone calls. You may have to go visit somebody this week because they have some, they, they need something you have. So let's change our posture by actually looking intentionally for ways God wants us to serve others. And the final thing I'd like to request is if anybody would like prayer, I invite you to come forward after I'm done praying for you and just receive prayer, just whatever you want, I mean, whatever you have on your heart. I'm just going to generally just kind of pray for people. I may not be able to take a bunch of requests or whatever. I'm just going to pray blessing and the strength of the Spirit. You don't have to come forward. I'm not trying to get an altar call. I want to just serve you by even just briefly praying for each one of you. Actually, that's not my final request. What I'd like to do is after a short time of prayer for whoever's left, because it's 12.15, you could feel free to go after our, my closing prayer. But then I would just like briefly for a few of you to pray and send me home. Just pray for me. I'm asking for you to serve me this way after I've been basically served the entire weekend. I'm asking for more. But I just feel to do that. You've been praying for me. Our family has health issues. I'm traveling. Um, we're getting better, though, by the way. Um, and it's just good to pray for one another and send people on their way. I always ask for our community to pray for me. I have a moment when I go to travel, they lay hands on me and send me. I feel so much more complete when they do that. So I'm asking you to do it from your end as well. And we should always be doing this sort of thing for one another. So yeah, hopefully you wrote these things down. If not, they're on recording, my list of requests. But I will now close in prayer for you. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for these precious people. Such precious brothers and sisters. Such dear, cherished Men and women, servants of the Lord, young men and women, older, young, uh, older men and women, Lord, so precious and dear in your sight and to one another, to me and to the leaders here, Lord, we're just, I'm just so grateful for these precious people. I'm so grateful for them. They, they add so much to your church and to your mission to the beauty of you on the earth, Lord. They contribute so much to what you're doing in the world. Lord, even some of their smallest prayers tower with such significance in the heavens. I'm so grateful for the quality, for the pure gold, the treasures that are here. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for their faith, for their loyalty to you, for their faith-filled prayers and their, their, their faithfulness in being a part of the church and just in being loyal to you and praying and whatever else, Lord, I'm grateful also for their love because there is such a spirit of community here, Lord. There's such love for one another. There's such love for the world, such love for you. Father, I am grateful for the great faith and love that are here in these precious people. And I only pray that you will increase their great faith and their great love for one another. I pray for the outpouring of your spirit upon this community of faith. I pray for the spirit of Christ to energize this precious people and shape them, Lord, where they could feel, really sense, and experience the grace of God in the Holy Ghost, conforming them from the heart to the image of Jesus, the greatest sign of which is his selfless service. May that stamp and that seal of your spirit be upon them in the wonderful name of Jesus. I pray that your blessing would be upon this church, upon every single person, on every home, on every family, that you would prosper them, that you would open doors of new service, of good jobs, of ministry. I pray for healing. I pray for health. I pray for good rest. I pray for the children, that they would be blessed, that they would be healthy, that they would prosper. I pray that the people around them would see your favor and your glow and your glory in on them and through them for the sake of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.
So if you have to go, please feel free. If you want to hang out, do as you wish. But if you also want prayer, I'm going to take a few minutes and pray for you before you pray for me. But here I'm closing the service. Chad, do you need to do anything? Say anything? You're, you're okay? What, can we like play a tape or something? Okay. So maybe you guys could just play something uh, lower volume, some music, and you guys just feel free to go or to feel, uh, feel free to come forward for prayer. Thank you.